all my life I've tried to understand myself and other people better. This friend said to me, we were, well, we were talking about what it is we were trying to do in fiction, and I said, I think what I'm trying to do is render precise, the imprecise, messy relations between human beings. And that to me seems one of the consolations of fiction, not to simplify, but to put in specific and yet generative terms something which seems inchoate and messy and impenetrable and and hard to put into words. So I think that's even before I was, you know, actually writing fiction, I think that's what I was trying to do. You know, even as a kid, words seemed to me a way to to try and figure out what was going on. <laughs> When Philip Roth decided to stop writing, he stuck a post-it on his computer mm -hmm. saying, the struggle with writing is done. Is writing a struggle for you? Yes, it is a struggle, but it's the most joyful struggle I know. It's, you know, I find it harder than anything else, which is why I do it. And I don't mean, there's nothing masochistic about that. You know, I don't do it because it's hard. <laughs> There are many things I, I don't do that are hard. Um, I mean that I know it's going to grow me more than anything else. It's always felt like a way to become a better person because you can't bullshit on the page. So it's kind of a way of... <laughs> How are you sure? <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe there is bullshit on the page. I just mean that to write fiction or to, to try and write fiction well, you have to both think very hard and try and perceive very hard. And I think those exercises, they make you see the world better and hopefully they make you see yourself better too. But it's it's kind of rigorous work, and you know I can feel it when I'm I'm writing in a non-rigorous way, when it's too easy, or when I'm not actually writing the truth. You know, when I'm just kind of skirting around something. It works best when it's hard, and you know I don't. I mean, I've had experiences when the writing itself is flowing and is very easy, but I know that's coming. It's kind of like that because I've done the thinking, you know. I often think that there are sort of two stages and that the first one is um, the painful thinking very hard and trying to figure something out in your mind. And then if you've done sufficient work with that, that's when you sort of get stupid, you know, and it's about intuition and flow and a complete lack of self-censorship. And then I guess there's the third stage, for me at least, which is editing and revising and finessing and you, you know catching things but i've had i've had two experiences where the writing just kind of it's going to be hard to avoid cliche here poured out of me and when i used to read writers talking about that sort of experience i would feel you know a great envy and also you know a little bit of an eye roll like <laughs> how pretentious There's this description I think of all the time in um, J.M. Kutzea's Elizabeth Costello. It's about a writer. She sort of has to get into heaven, although it's you know, much more allegorical than that and it's never called heaven. But we understand that this is a sort of process of getting into heaven. And to get into heaven, she has to articulate her profession or rather than her profession, her vocation, I think is the right word. And she says, I'm a writer. And they're like, nah, you can't come in. And then she sort of tries again. She's like, well, I write this and I do this. And, you know, it's still not working. And then she finally says, she uses this phrase, a secretary of the invisible. And I, I mean, just saying that phrase, I get, I get chills down my arms. Yeah, it, it brings tears to my eyes. It's such a beautiful blend of, you know, the very humble being a secretary, putting the hours in, sitting down at your desk with your pen in your hand or your fingers on your laptop and listening and sort of submitting almost to something higher. And then, you know, there is this ineffable, slightly mystical thing, the invisible. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've had two experiences when I've, you know, truly felt a secretary of the invisible and that I'm just listening to something. I don't necessarily think that is you know, divine in the sense of something truly external. 
I think it might come from us. Like, I think that invisible that she is a secretary of um, in that novel, you know, might be herself. It might be her invisible self. But that, to me, does not make it any less profound or moving or compelling in its mystery. What kind of reader are you? A greedy one, a demanding reader, an interrogative reader, I hope. I write criticism as well. And, you know, to my mind, the job of the critic is to lovingly interrogate something. And in the same way that when you meet a person or when you're developing a relationship with a person, you don't want to be dishonest in not seeing their faults, but you want to compassionately interrogate them and take them take a human being in terms of their internal logic and in the same way I want to I want to read a book and try and tune in to that book's internal logic and to respect its logic but also to see where it might be lacking in integrity not in a moral sense although I mean maybe this is a sort of Victorian idea but I often think there is a correlation between what is happening structurally or formally and what the book might be saying at a more uh, humanistic level. So I think maybe there is a correlation between the Can two. you develop that? I mean, you know, the ideal thing is, is when there is a seamlessness between them and when you think there is no other way this book could have been written. And so there is a great sense of cohesion and integrity. What do you need to start writing a new work, a new book? Well, I'm only on number two, <laughs> so it seems a little silly to be speaking in, in grand generalities about my practice because I'm, I'm sort of new to my practice too. I can say, though, that my experience, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm sort of, I guess, halfway through writing what I hope will become a second novel, and it feels hugely different to the first. The first sort of, you know, I didn't sit down and think, today I'm beginning my novel. It was more you know, scenes would come to me and I'd be kind of trying to find the heat of a scene or, or the center of a scene and what it meant and how it might relate to something else. So I wrote my first novel in a very piecemeal way and also with a great deal of doubt and uncertainty and embarrassment that this was pure vanity and I wasn't writing for the, the right reasons. This second one it was an experience of being a bit of a secretary to the invisible i was that's the right reason i think the right reason is having something to say and finding a way to say it honestly so it might come about through all sorts of reasons i mean i think it doesn't really matter how the piece gets done how the book gets done it's what you're left with at the end and whether there's a, an honesty to that I mean, certainly as a writer, it's much more pleasant to feel that something is just coming to you and you're listening to it rather than, you know, desperately uh, reaching for things and trying to pull them together. So for this, this book I'm working on now, it was just a voice. It was just, you know, that benign psychosis of a voice in your head. And it was a young male voice. He's a, a 22-year-old guy. I was just trying to sleep one night and this voice was in my head. And, you know, one of the, I think, the sort of really like humdrum things, very practical things about being a writer or trying to be a writer is just catching these little moments and knowing that you have to reach for your phone or your notebook or whatever and write it down. So I did indeed just reach for my phone, which is not very romantic, and, you know, opened up my notes function on my iPhone and was kind of thumbing in these words of his. And then I thought that was it. And I, you know, look at them in the morning and probably reject them. But I kept, you know, I kept trying to fall back asleep and then there would be more and he had more to say and more to say. And I just woke up the next morning with a sense of urgency that I had to get, I had to get him down. And then that first day just wrote sort of 2,000 words, which isn't a huge amount, but for me in a day is a huge amount. And then since then it's felt like the characters are sort of telling me what they need. I don't have to ask them. And I don't think any of this means that this second novel will necessarily be better than the first, although I hope, you know, I hope it is a, a deeper and more ambitious and more solid thing. 
I'm a better listener now. Like I can, I can hear the characters better now and trust them as well and trust myself to, to be hearing them right. Are you the secretary of your characters? I am, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm their secretary. I'm just listening to what they have to say, yeah. In the word secretary, you have the word secret. So you keep something secret. I love that idea. That's very appealing to me. Meryl Streep, I think, once said that, you know, whenever she's on stage or um, in front of a camera, she has a secret. Like her character always has a secret. And there's a magnetism to that. You know, the sort of Mona Lisa quality to it. It's like, you know, you want to know what she's thinking. What are you not telling us? What is your magical secret? So, yeah, I think any character that is, um, that has no element of mystery probably won't be that interesting. Human beings are mysterious because there is no such thing as a, a fixed character or a fixed personality. And I think that's one of the things fiction does so well is to illustrate how character is relational. You know, we become ourselves through other people and we are different people with other people. And in that way, you know, I always think like, oh, I'm, I'm really bad at plot. As a reader, I'm, I, I'm not really reading for plot. It always seems slightly cheapening to me when there's a very sort of pacey and um, uh, intricately constructed sort of plot because that just doesn't seem like real life but I do think character character makes plot you know if I'm just listening to my characters then I know what they're going to do um, in the same way by themselves exactly yeah in the same way that you know in life we see it with our friends their personalities sort of dictate their fate you just know you kind of know what's what's going to happen to them. I mean, of course, you know, there are surprises and disasters and strokes of good fortune, but I guess you sort of know how, how they would react to those things, you know, and in, in that way, what they might become or what their lives might become. So you don't have a general plan in mind when you start writing? For this one, I, I do, yeah, I do have a sense of where it's going and, and what these people how these people so it's it's a young man who becomes infatuated with a, an older couple um, and he's an the younger man is an intern in a magazine so there are this you know sort of side plot with one of his fellow interns and I it did come to me pretty sort of wholesale I, I did have a sense but I think that's because the characters also seem to present themselves pretty I mean not fully formed of course but but there was a sort of insistence to them But yeah, it's, it's by no means, you know, I, d I definitely don't plot it out chapter by chapter. <laughs> I'm still not quite sure how this one's going to end. I just have a, a vague idea. You're writing your second novel. What did you learn from your first novel about writing? I learned that you can't put, or you shouldn't put any financial pressure on your art, that it's really not fair to your art to do that. It's going to damage you and your art, I think. So I try and think of writing fiction, at least, as something completely removed from the sort of material world of how much money will this make, if any. <laughs> and fiction doesn't make any money. But I made the mistake of, of you know, sort of hoping that, that my first book might give me like a little bit of a financial reprieve or cushion. And that was really unfair on it. And I also learned that it takes as long as it takes And that for a piece of journalism, a deadline is, is useful and necessary. But the fiction, at least for me, doesn't work that way. And it needs to be sort of honored, you know. And I feel like I need to have, I need to kind of just place my faith in the project rather than imposing rules, deadlines, needs on the project. I guess having faith in the project and honoring the project's needs was the main thing. And, well, for the first one in particular, just knowing that it might take a while for the, the truth of it to emerge. And, you know, I had a moment of real, well, many moments, but one particular moment of crisis with the first where I had signed with my wonderful publisher, Catapult, 
and everything was good you know it was it was technically all great it was like it was happening it was underway but I just had a complete loss of faith and I thought not only could the novel never be good enough to be published but that you know I just wasn't a writer that I'd been deluding myself and that this was all just vanity and kind of pretentiousness and just wanting to be a writer rather than being a writer you know I, I really kind of spite you know dug myself into a place of complete despair you know I think that came from pride actually if I can have more humility about you know a first draft or a second draft or however many drafts not being good enough and think of that as something to be worked at rather than you know some kind of rather than that being an indictment of my deficiency as a writer because everybody I think I don't know except maybe Mozart or something you know everybody has to work at it and that's humbling and particularly for my first you know there was just such an enormous vast gap between what I wanted and what I could do you know I mean just in, in terms of a sort of craft level I I just needed to sort of put in more hours as a writer as a maker of sentences and as a structurer of novels you know I just wasn't up to the task really so the first novel was sort of teaching myself how to write a novel as much as it was writing that novel you know you said uh, there was a gap between what I wanted and what I did how can you know what you wanted without writing it um what is this kind of feeling well I read a lot <laughs> I, I know what good prose is <laughs> and I couldn't write it you know I still, you know, feel, you know, when I feel like a great dissatisfaction with my prose now, I try and remind myself that this is a good thing because this is an engine of, you know, ambition and aspiration. There is no such thing as, you know, we have this, we suffer as a society, the myth of perfectibility. There is no such thing as a perfect book. And, you know, and I, I mean, I'm getting off track here, but I feel that women maybe feel it even more because, you know, we are sold this myth of bodily and everything else, perfectibility. Hopefully less so now. I guess, you know, I had to accept with this first novel that, you know, it does definitely fall short in my mind. And I had this funny, I was it's astonished, like truly astonished to get some favorable reviews. And they seemed to me so generous and unbelievable. And mixed in with that astonishment and that enormous gratitude was something a little, a little trickier and a little uneasier, which was coming from something sort of outside the book and outside myself, which was this feeling that, <laughs> that criticism has failed. <laughs> Because I, I felt like, no, I, I actually really want a critic to see all the flaws in this because that I feel will just make us all better. You know, that will all make us want to be better readers, better writers, and by extension, better human beings. It's like I don't, it's so distressing to me when, when mediocre things are praised and are not interrogated, not through any kind of punitive feeling, the opposite. It's like, I want us all to be better, you know? I desperately want us all to be you better. You need help, that's what you mean. I don't really mean it in that sense. I just mean it more that... You know, I, what I hope is that if this second novel gets published, and of course it's an if, there are no certainties, I hope that if there is a review that honestly, t you know, takes the book to task, that it does feel salutary to me. Like, of course, in terms of my ego, it will be a little crushing or a little disappointing. But, you know, the thing that's, that's greater than my ego <laughs> is I hope and the thing that I always want to be greater than my ego is a broader belief in literature and a broader faith in literature and in books and reading and readers and so that I hope is what I'm trying to serve. Literature what does it mean to you? Is it another world? To me it's like how I live and I don't mean that um, wait that sounds really silly what I mean is you know even when I'm not reading I'm a I'm reading the world. Like the act of reading to me is like the act of 
living <laughs> because when there's even when there's not a book in front of me I'm trying to be a reader I'm trying to engage with the world and with people with that same attention and compassionate interrogation I think attention is key you know in a, a kind of Buddhist sense to really pay attention to anything or anyone is an act of love it's investing that thing with meaning almost and it's an act of love towards that thing but it's there's also a, a refraction of that love you know if you if you read a great novel with a great deal of attention you feel that reward you know I mean you you love the book but you feel the book loving you <laughs> you know I've seen that in in interviewing people in, in terms of my journalism or in teaching students but when you try and give a person your you know your full and honest loving attention they just bloom in front of you you know and it's very hard to do that like we don't really do that to each other but when you do it's it's kind of miraculous <laughs> i'm gonna leave the space please hold the microphone and add whatever you want to the interview oh <laughs> It feels very strange now to be speaking into an empty room, um, but I'm looking at a wall of, well, a bookcase of books, and that sort of seems an appropriate note to end on, uh, sitting here in silence, but knowing that there's a, a great volubility <laughs> right in front of my eyes because all these books are full of words. <laughs> 